I bring you greetings in the matchless name of my Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Reverend Bob Lico bringing a presentation today about the celebration, if you can call it a celebration, certainly the penitential season of Lent is fast coming upon us. March 2nd, I believe, uh, is the official kickoff day. And coming out of the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, I and, and very high confessional, in fact, the highest confessional Lutheran Church in America, Zion, Detroit, was where we cut our rubrical Lutheran teeth, if you will. Uh, and I've always been associated with the confessional aspect of the LCMS, unfortunately. In some ways, it's very good. In other ways, not so good at all. So I entitled this presentation, Lenten Lunacy or Divinely Led Denial. And it can be one or the other. And I would encourage you, if you like this presentation, please hit that like, share, and subscribe button. We have almost 100 videos up on the Honey Badger Bob YouTube channel on a wide variety of topics, and I think that they would benefit you, and I hope that they do, to the glory of our Lord God and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Well, the first thing we need to look at is, is the entire practice of Lent a biblical practice? Do we find a Lenten penitential period of time expressly taught or even indirectly implied from Genesis to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ? The answer to that is very simple, no. The practice of Lenten fasting, and I underline Lenten fasting, is not found in either the Old or New Covenants. It is not a biblical doctrine of the church. Now let me unpack this a minute. I said that Lenten fasting is not found in either the Old or New Covenants. Fasting most assuredly is. And honestly, it is one of the least practiced of the spiritual disciplines given to us by our Lord to help us along pathways of intimacy with our Savior. Well, fasting is one way to do it. In fact, our Lord said in the Gospels, not if you fast, but when you fast. So fasting in and of itself is a biblical practice, teaching, doctrine, if you will, dogma. But we are really never given, most assuredly in the New Testament, any direction as to when or for how long. There are a few things said, but there certainly is nothing demanding a week-long fast, a three-day fast, a seven-day fast, a 40-day fast. And I come from a practice within the charismatic movement, our congregation in Detroit, Jubilee Christian Church, had as a practice at the beginning of the new year to fast for the month, 30 days. And we would, and most of the people fasted for the full 30 days. Now, this was not a complete total fast. We were uh, enjoined to have soup at dinner, but we fasted breakfast and lunch, had very little, if anything, to eat at dinner, and we met and prayed. So fasting is a biblical practice. And as God leads you, obey his leading. But it's not a biblical doctrine. Now, that's the next point we need to unpack. I said that it is not a biblical doctrine of the church. It is, in quotes, a human doctrine. A man-made doctrine and discipline and practice engaged upon by many in the body of Christ. The Roman Catholics and the Orthodox sects, the Greek and Malkite and uh, Russian Orthodox churches, certainly Lutherans and, and Episcopalians of some stripes, 
uh, teach as doctrine, as church doctrine, uh, fasting and Lenten fasting. But it's not a biblical doctrine. There are a lot of doctrines within the church that are human. Some of them pretty neutral, not really going to hurt you. Many others rather harmful and will take you further from Christ. But my point here is very simply this. Is Lent a biblical practice? No. Moving on. Well, then, what is the origin of Lent? If it's not found in the Bible, honey badger, it's not found in the book of Acts, it's not found in the writings of, of the writing apostles, Paul and James and Peter. Well, no, no, it's not found in the Bible. We've established that. Well, let me read what Christianity Today from their history segment has to, and this is a generally, if you look up Lent and you look up the definition, you look up the history, Virtually everybody agrees with this. This is pretty much a standard, non-nuanced history, and I'll read. In 325, 325 years after the establishment of the visible church on earth, three centuries later, the Council of Nicaea discussed a 40-day Lenten season of fasting. But it's unclear whether its original intent was just for new Christians preparing for baptism, but it soon encompassed the whole church. How exactly the churches counted those 40 days varied depending on location. In the East, one only fasted on weekdays. The Western church's Lent was one week shorter, but included Saturdays. In both places, the observance was both strict and serious. I highlighted that, whether you were a Western branch, Christian Eastern branch, the observance was both strict and serious. Only one meat was taken a day near the evening. There was to be no meat, fish, or animal products eaten. I'm sorry, only one meal was taken a, a day near the evening. There was to be no meat, fish, or animal products eaten. ChristianityToday.com so we see that Lent did not even come into being regularly practiced by the entire church for over 300 years, much like the man-made and false doctrine of infant baptism. It also did not come into the church for several hundred years. And recent history and archaeology is proving that it came into the church really as a result of a horrible plague and the Greek believers didn't know what was going to happen to their babies. They forgot what Paul said, and so they began that demonic practice. And I call it demonic because they say that sprinkling the water on the infant's head in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit gives them eternal life, which contradicts the plain teaching of Scripture in many, many places. Even Luther knew better, but he taught falsely in this area. So it's a man-made doctrine, comes into the church 325 years later. Fine, nothing wrong with fasting again. But it was unclear about the original intent because, you see, originally, new converts prepared, they were catechized for a year, and then on Easter, uh, I believe, Easter Sunday or that Saturday night, I'm not sure, but they were baptized then. They were baptized in the nude and, if possible, in running water. That was the formula for hundreds of years in the church. Well, actually, I, I take that back. I'm, I'm not speaking uh, correctly. That was not the formula for hundreds of years. It became the formula, but initially it was you heard the word of God, you were convicted of your sins, and you were baptized immediately. As time progressed and uh, things became just almost from the beginning a little more cloudy, then the church started this work of, well, we got to teach you for a year what it means to be a Christian and then we'll baptize you. It's not just a question. You believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead, and that he's coming back. Do you believe in him and him alone and no other gods in your life? Yep, you can be baptized. Now it's turned into a whole year-long process 
of fasting and denial and 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 a work and this happened really in the greek section again of the church not the jews but again like anything else it seems to be kind of a works righteousness uh it's very appealing gives give people something to do and attach a blessing to it and believe me they'll do it all right soon it encompasses the whole church so soon everybody starts this fasting now to this day the East and the West do not agree about the beginning of Easter. It's been a huge problem. People went to blows. People hated one another over this. And sadly, this kind of distinction still goes on today. You see the bad fruit from man-made doctrines. Fasting is a great thing. Seeking the Lord's wonderful. But when you codify it and say you must do this, this must be done every year from this day to this day. You shall come to church this many times for this long. You shall not eat these certain foods. You shall not watch certain things. You shall not dot, dot, dot. You shall, you shall, you shall not. Well, come on. That's called legalism. Sucks all the fun and reality and power out of what you're doing. Lent, as I've been saying, is a human tradition. Say that with me. Lent is a human tradition. Human religious traditions can impede God's will. See what Jesus says in Mark 7:13, Making the word of God of no effect through your traditions, which you have handed down. And many such things you do. The Lord warns us to be aware, be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Matthew 16, verse 6. So the word of God can be made fruitless and powerless in the lives of a congregation through following demonic and or man-made human traditions. So human traditions can hinder and impel, impede the will of God for a Christian's life. Be aware of this. However, other side of the coin, guys, let's be fair. Not all human religious traditions are bad. 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 15 says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us either by our spoken word or by our letter. So on one hand, Jesus says, look, through your traditions, you make the word of God of no effect. On the other hand, we are to hold and stand firm and cling to the traditions that are apostolic, that are biblical, that are in the letter, if you will, in the Bible. Those things that can be pointed out as a tradition, tradition of the elders, if you wish, Christian elders. Okay, that's fine. But man-made traditions, and how do you know if it's man-made? Because it has no contextual biblical support. Maybe a couple texts are cherry-picked, taken out of their set and setting, and forced and crammed into this, and you're told, oh, well, this is what that means. I'll, I'll give you an example and we'll move on. Okay, let's use infant baptism. There is not one text that shows an infant being baptized. Those who support infant baptism will say, well, it says here in Acts, the entire household were baptized. Yes, it does. So what? Well, so there had to have been infants in the household after all. Where does it say that? We don't know that. We don't know that at all. We don't know how many people comprised this, that household they were talking of. It could have been two maiden aunts and four teenage children. Why do we all of a sudden assume, oh, there are infants there? Really? That's an argument from silence, and it's not exegeting the scripture, it's eisegesis. It's adding to God's word. It's false. That's how you know it's a human tradition. There's no contextual support for it. But the traditions that the apostles delivered, 
have biblical support. And so, in that case, maybe not a bad thing. Calls for the wisdom of the saints. Well, let's just say that Lent, although it is a human tradition, when practiced rightly, can bear good fruit. Okay. Well, that's why I asked the question, what, what, what is the purpose of Lent? I remember Miles Monroe, who I knew personally, came to our church before he was big in Detroit, when he was Oral Roberts' star son in the gospel. And he taught about his, his revelation of purpose. And he did make a true statement. When the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. And this is most certainly true when it comes to Lent. When God's people don't know the purpose of Lent, the excuse me, abuse of Lent is inevitable. It's the same thing with baptism, the Lord's Supper, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When the purpose of these things is not known or it's misunderstood, the abuse of them is inevitable. Well, the, basically, to boil it all down, to take the hay out of the barn and bring it down to where the horses are, as Donald J. Barnhouse used to say, denial leading to death. That's the whole purpose of Lent. You are to deny your flesh its appetites over a period of time, leading, you're suffocating them over 40 days, and hopefully by the end of the 40 days, that albatross of whatever it is drops off your neck. And the theological hinge that uh, those that really teach Lent as a doctrine is, of course, the temptation of our Master, our Lord Jesus, in the desert, where he was led of the Holy Spirit and tempted of the enemy for 40 days and 40 nights. So we, too, enter into our Lord's temptations and sufferings, although he did them for us. We can't add to his work nor subtract from it. His work is complete. He did it all. All we're doing is emulating, is, is imitating that, on a personal level or a congregational level. Now, during the 40 days, this is what I'm talking about the theory, we are to be more prayerful and deny the fleshly appetites that are hindering our, number one, fellowship with the Lord, number two, with our brethren in the body of Christ, the visible church, and number three, things that are impacting our witness to those that are unregenerated or outside the body of Christ currently. So the reason we do these things is to place ourselves before God and say, Lord, I know uh, there are things in my life that are displeasing to you, that are displeasing to me. There are things that I'm aware of. There are things that I don't even know because a man's ways seem right in his own eyes. So Master, as I come before you during these 40 days, please, by your Spirit, reveal to me the things in my life that are hindering our fellowship, that hinder my fellowship with my brothers and sisters, that hinder me from seeing Jesus Christ in each and every one of them. Maybe there are things I do or ways I act or beliefs I hold that or really a negative impact on my witness as a Christian and your ambassador? That's what we fast and pray about during this 40 days. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says this, Wherefore, seeing we are also encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, here we go, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, the race that is set before us. So that's the purpose of Lent. It is the laying aside of every weight and the sin which easily besets us. Is it anger? Is it gossip? Is it lust? Some of those really hideous things. It could just be lukewarmness or 
a general lack of concern. It could be apathy. Well, those are weights. Seek the face of God during Lent to reveal them to you and ask for his grace to set you free from them. Our goal in Lent is seen in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, here I am. I'm still here on the earth. Yet not I. Oh, it looks like the honey badger. It may look like Tom, Dick, and Harry. But Christ liveth in me and in them. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So yes, we are to lay aside, deny every weight in the sin. Lead, let that work work in us. Your flesh will cry out. But as we discipline ourselves and say no to our flesh, those desires will eventually die and go away. And we will have victory in that area of our lives. There are so many things I could begin to list that our Lord Jesus has completely delivered me from. Things that you can throw in front of me that will never be an issue in my life ever, ever again. Why? Because I died completely to them by his grace and through applying his word. Now, there are many other areas that I have yet to die to that I struggle with daily. And I will have things to deal with and struggle with until the day I take my last breath. And so will you. But nonetheless, we fight the good fight. And it's a good fight because we win in Christ Jesus. Now, why 40 days? Well, again, we look at Jesus, and 40 is an, it's a very important number in the Bible. 40 years, 40 days. Moses went up with the Lord 40 days. We have these events. So 40 is a good number in the eyes of God. Now, here's some interesting scientific news. According to some reports, and there are many on Google, it takes approximately 40 days of repeated actions to become habitual, whether something is good or bad. That's how habits are formed. You continue to do the same thing in the same way, day after day, maybe at the same time, and it becomes somewhat ingrained in us, just what we do, just how we operate. And these can be very good things, or they can be very bad and harmful and uh, things that as our weights, but it takes about 40 days. Lent, when consciously and purposively observed, can be a tremendous boon by helping people form lasting spiritual disciplines. For instance, if you're like many Christians, too many of us, and you don't either read the Bible or hear the Bible on a daily basis, well, begin to do so during Lent. Say, Father, this is your love letter from heaven. It's all that I have regarding objective truth about you contained in these 66 books. It's all that I have to know about the Lord Jesus Christ and to know him and, and what he expects of me and how to walk in your ways. And begin to either hear or read your Bible, start at Genesis, and continue for the 40 days. I can promise you, if you listen an hour a day in the morning and an hour at night, or that would work, an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening, you will get through Genesis, through the Revelation, in less than 40 days. So through Lent, you can hear the entire Bible. And then that becomes just what you do. You get up and every day you hear the Bible, or you get up every day and read the Bible. You get up every morning and pray. You get up and every morning, you know, whatever. Meditate on the Lord. Well, 40 days is about the time it takes to form a godly habit. Now, on the other hand, Lent can equally be, and often is, nothing more than a frivolous, quasi-spiritual exercise which is endured versus celebrated. I think the Fat Tuesday orgiastic indulgences 
right before Ash Wednesday, demonstrate the hearts of many regarding Lent. Since Fat Tuesday is also a, in quotes, religious celebration. In other words, people go out, and you know this, the day before, you know, Fat Tuesday, everybody goes out, gets drunk, and tries to get laid. Down in Mardi Gras, down on Bourbon Street, the women pop their tops so you throw them plastic beads and all manner of licentiousness and immorality and demonic activity goes on right before Ash Wednesday. Never forget the Kennedy trial. They were in church after uh, Fat Tuesday getting drunk, raped the, the one guy rapes the girl and he's in church next Sunday morning. A good Roman Catholic. So 40 days forms habits. And if you're conscious and if you're serious about what's going on during this 40 days and you mean business with the Lord God Almighty and you want to change and you want to progress in your walk and fellowship and knowledge of the Lord, Lent is a great time to do this. And Lent's effects all depend on us. What do you mean by that, Bob? That just sounds unbiblical. I mean, apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. I know. I understand. But when it comes to man-made human doctrines, uh, you can't anticipate nor expect the Lord to necessarily be involved. He may and he may not. He may show up and honor your fasting. He may not. This isn't a biblical celebration. This isn't a biblical feast. We do it in his name. A lot of people do a lot of things in the name of Jesus. And on that day, he says, though, the Lord, Lord, did we not? And he said, I never knew you. Not that I knew you and I forgot you or you once were saved and lost your salvation. No, look it up in the Greek. He never knew them at any point in existence. They were never his children. So, I'm just saying, what you get out of your 40-day Lenten experience depends on you. We get out what we put in, like it or not. And I'm not denying the grace and mercy of God whatsoever. But when it comes to spiritual growth, spiritual advancement, the knowledge of the Lord and the ways of God, it requires work on your part, labor. You just are not zapped. Sorry, my sign gift enthusiastic brothers and sisters. No one can lay hands on you and impart sanctification can impart wisdom, can impart knowledge or experience with God. That's mono a dios, man to God, if you will. Lent's effect depends on us. If, big if, notice, you are sincere about growing more into the image of Christ, read 2 Corinthians 3.18, from faith to faith, glory to glory, looking at the mirror darkly, being conformed to his image, and walking in liberty from weights and carnal habits, then Christ can and will set you totally free. After all, it is for liberty that Christ has set us free. Galatians 5.1 As you seek his face during Lent about certain things, things that trouble your spiritual walk, the Lord will set you free from them. Why wouldn't he? Expect to be set free. Don't expect to go back and be like the dog who runs back to his own vomit or the pig that's been cleansed that jumps right back into the pig pen. Don't be that person. Know that the Lord wants to set you free from all sin. He died to set you free. And if you're not walking in the liberty that he has purchased, he's not happy about that. And he wants every one of his children to walk in the glorious liberty of the sons of God. He wants all of us to awake unto righteousness, the reality that we are the righteousness of God now in Christ Jesus and sin not. To say no to the temptations that the enemy 
and our flesh and this world offers. It's called spiritual growth. Read 1 John. There is victory in Jesus. And through Lent, that can be the springboard to the victory you have been seeking and desiring. Because now you're serious. Now you're pushing yourself back from the table. Now you're coming before the Lord in prayer and saying, Father, deliver me from this. It sickens me. I'm sick of myself. I'm sick of this weight. I'm sick of it. I want it out of my life in the name of Jesus. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes, whatever changes, Lord, I've got to make. People I associate with, maybe the books I read, the programs I watch, what I do on the online, whatever. Whatever, God, whatever it takes. Reveal it to me by your spirit. Grant me grace. Give me patience and, and faith to overcome. Do you think he answers those prayers with, no, no, I want you to sit and wallow in your sin, you poor, miserable sinner. Ugh. If it wasn't for Jesus, ugh, I don't know. No, for God so loved the world, he sent his son. Lastly, beware. And that is simply a contraction of the words, be aware. Lent can be the tremendous blessing I just spoke of. But Lent can also devolve, and it has in many cases and places, into a fleshly activity. That is, fasting, certain things, increased church attendance, almsgiving, etc. All can be used by our flesh to make the celebrant think themselves better and more pious or holy due to these momentary denials. Lent is worthless. This 40 days and everything they did during those 40 days was totally worthless spiritually in their lives. In fact, may have been accounted as sin against them. Because Lent can become merely another opportunity for us to practice our righteousness before men that Jesus warned against in Matthew 6, 1. Ash Wednesday, with the places of ashes on the forehead, can easily fall into the category described by Jesus in Matthew. It can be a form of practicing your righteousness or piety before men, and it is, becomes worthless then. Uh, in your life and, 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 and can't really be used by God to bless others. So we have to be serious and sincere. If you're going to practice Lent at all, then do that. Either be sincere, be focused, and be truly devoted to the Lord and repentant of the errors in your life and seeking advancement spiritually. Wonderful. But if you're just doing this, I'll give you a, per a perfect example. I won't mention his name. One Lutheran pastor who was very involved in my work in becoming a Lutheran pastor. Uh, fortunately, God spared me from that huge mistake uh, for Lent. I did my vicarage was during the Lenten season. And... He was giving up macadamia nuts for Lent, and he kept a new can on his desk right in front of him for the 40 days. And he'd look at it, and I'd come in, and he'd shake that can and look at me, and, you know, ah, 27 days, or 15 days, 8 days, 2 days, and, you know, and rubbing his hand together, tomorrow's the day I can eat macadamia nuts again. And sure enough, that day came, and he popped his lid, and thank you, Jesus, and went back and ate his macadamia nut. Oh, and that was his Lenten discipline. It was worthless, frankly. That was a joke. It was a light, meaningless thing. Well, brother, you don't know the man may really have a problem with macadamia nuts. He had a lot more spiritual problems. I could have pointed out half a dozen of them to him that he couldn't have denied. Say, look, brother, uh, a man's ways are right in his own eyes, but here's, have you considered this, this, and the other thing? Uh, well, let's work together and get, get these things dealt with. You'll be a more effective pastor and Christian. No, no, no. If you're just one of these people that gives up uh, watching soap operas for 30 days or 40 days, and then you go right back to them, where, what victory did you achieve over your flesh? 
You're just like the dog going back to its vomit. I'm sorry. Correct me if I'm wrong. How am I wrong about that perception? Guys, if you are giving something up, you're giving something up that is hindering your walk with Christ. Why in God's name would you go and pick that thing up again? It's like you committed adultery. You've been forgiven for it. And then after you've been forgiven, you go out and do it. You just feel free. Now I'm free to go do it again. I'm going back to it. No change. No conviction. Well, your 40 days, I don't care if you went to church every day, went to every Wednesday service, went to the, the increased prayer meals and uh, Lenten uh, soup night or whatever. Worthless. Worthless. But it doesn't have to be. And I the whole point that I'm getting at here is this year, especially with all that's going on with the pandemic, with the global drought, the global pandemics, the warfare that's going on, this can be and is a very important time to fast and to pray and to seek the face of God and the will of God and to ask and, and receive as much wisdom and discernment as possible. And this Lenten time, I'm telling you, it is a great it's a great season. It just depends on you and I. What we put into it, how sincere we are, are we truly devoted, or are we just playing around? You know, I can't wait for this 40 days to be over to get back to doing whatever, to go back to eating whatever, watching whatever. Well, those people really are, are out of touch. They, they're very unaware of any besetting sin in their life, and, and perhaps they don't have any. I'm not saying that we're all just walking around with tons of garbage on us. We're not. Jesus it gives us victory. But all of us can grow. There's room for improvement. None of us are sinless or sin-free. So we all can improve, and there are things that we can sharpen and grow in, and we should. And I believe that the church, even through a man-made practice, has given us 40 days where the church opens its doors and, in, and encourages the children of God to draw near in prayer and in worship and in denial. Those are all godly things. They're all biblical practices. They're all rolled up into this 40-day penitential season. And yeah, there's some doctrinal garbage and doo-doo that clings to it here and there. So what? Just don't be impacted by it. This really boils down on, on the main level between you and your Lord, first and foremost, and then you and the visible church on the secondary level. So be aware of the dangers that the enemy will try to get you to be uber pious because look at me, I successfully did my for Yeah, you got victory over gossip, but pride sprung up. Now you got to deal with pride. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm saying. Be aware. But also, don't rely on your own strength. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Rely on the fact that Jesus, our great high priest, wants us all to be victorious over each and every sin that besie besieges us, that is keeping us from him, that is blocking our fellowship. The Lord wants to, to totally remove that from each and every one of our lives. And during Lent, I encourage us all to seek his face, find out what those areas are, and by his grace and through our faith in his promises, seek and receive the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. A blessed Lent to one and all who love our Lord.